Welcome back to the Common Fan Podcast. I am TJ Burkle, as always, alongside Maddie Owens Sr. and Geoff in Lincoln. It's another view from the Bland stands. Friend of the program, Evan Bland from the Omaha World Herald is back with us. And we are we're excited to be talking to Evan. We're not excited to be talking about the flaming hot pile of garbage that we saw on display at Memorial Stadium on Saturday night. But we're going to get into Matt Rule's press conference this week. We're going to get into some other conversations that are buzzing around this very unsettled fan base at the moment. You know what can always make me feel better, guys? Beef. Delicious beef. Meat. Certified Piedmont cheese. That's right. Delicious beef. And could be a steak. Could be a ribeye or a sirloin or a fillet or a flat iron. Beef uh, bacon. Beef bacon. Could be beef bacon. Could a be ground beef. Could be a bratwurst. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Could be a burger. Could be um, ground beef in chili, which I know Geoff loves. Um, Easy. Could be could be beef ribs. Could be any. You know where you can find all these things? You know where you can find any conceivable form of beef on the planet? CPbeef.com. Certified Piedmontese is premium Nebraska beef raised and grazed in the state, in the beautiful Sand Hills region of the state. And you can get 25% off using the promo code common fan, all one word, common fan. Go to cpbeef.com. You can get beef delivered anywhere across all 50 states. And you can get 25% off any eligible item using the promo code common fan. You can also, if you're one of these people who likes to see it and touch it and feel it and talk to it in person, then you can go to your local. I don't know. I don't know why you would talk, talk to, to talk to the beef, but uh, you can go to the uh, local. They're more delicious. If you talk to the steaks before you put them on the grill. Oh, delicious! Uh, and steak. give them a little tap. Give how, a little, that's how right. I want to cook you and eat. You. <laughs> we're, we're in danger of derailing very quickly. Uh, <laughs> you can go to your local Mercado butcher shop. There's two in Omaha. There's one in Lincoln. You can get all the, fresh butcher items, as well as some hot food ready to eat. Uh, so cpbeef.com, promo code common fan, local Mercado butcher shops. You can't go wrong. Certified Piedmontese powering the Husker football team and powering the common fan podcast. You can also check out our brand new website. It's not that brand new anymore. It's still pretty new. Uh, no website. It's bright and shiny. www.commonfan.co. We went to TS Web Services to build the site for us. Whether you need web development or hosting, they've got you covered. You can trust TS Web Services to take your online presence to the next level. Their team was very responsive and delivered high quality work. TS Web Services can help improve, redesign, or host your website. Check out tswebservices.com to learn more. Evan. TJ. How are you? (laughs) Hanging in. The, uh, the the certified Piedmontese burger was awfully good before the game Saturday. It's your guys' tailgate. Yes. The game, not not Thank so uh, delicious for those showing nice up. Wow, take. nice. Did you think no. about that in advance? That was really good. No, no. Yeah, he's he's good. professional, TJ. He's a pro. He's, professional. <laughs> comes, he's a pro. Just comes off the top. No, I'm I'm sorry that had to be the game you all uh, convened at Memorial Stadium to see. That that was a surprise. <laughs> I, th- I was I was awesome. That. It was awesome to meet you in person, Evan. Thanks for yeah. yes, it was. Tailgate. I'm glad you glad you had a burger and uh, and it was fun to fun to talk and and catch up. And we even talked about how miserable the next two weeks would be if Nebraska should Nebraska drop the game. Uh, and Geoff, sorry, what were you gonna say? I just I thought about that too after Evan mentioned it. This 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 all three of us at the game at the same time. I don't I don't want to speak ill of it, but it doesn't seem to be working. This happened last year too during the Iowa. Game. Well, now it's not a not it's gonna, not a real big sample size, Jeff. I don't think we can make. I'm not, dec- not going to give up on it like yet. That right now, but I, it just well, it's uh... unfortunately like most people and most combinations of friends could say that for about the last ten years of Nebraska <laughs> yeah. football, right. like just going there's, to any home game. Yeah, there's, there's no happy, there's yeah. no lucky shirts anymore. There's no lucky yeah. hats. Those have all experienced. No, there's nothing good. No good happen. things happen anymore. No, nothing actually, good happens, as it turns out. As it mm. turns out. Uh, so we are recording this episode on Monday night. We normally do the view from the bland stands episodes on Tuesday nights and put them out Wednesday morning. I'm not sure if we're going to put this one out Tuesday or Wednesday, but point being 
Uh, we have the perspective now of the Matt Rule Monday press conference. I don't even know if the coordinators are talking on Tuesday or not. They're not talking. Okay, so we're, you're not going to miss no. anything. Comment this is all, all all the availability all week. Okay, great. Yeah. Great. Good to know. So it was interesting, and you know we are uh, nuanced and sophisticated citizens of the world here at the Common Fan Podcast. I feel like we always give grace. We always understand there's probably more context than what we're seeing on Twitter. But I tell you what, more there were some co- quotes and comments uh, from the press conference, not having all the context. Admittedly, I didn't watch it, but there was some stuff out on social media today that caught my eye more than normal, Evan. Um, the first thing is Coach Rule saying, you know, he admitted what they're doing on offense isn't working. And he said they're gonna he's gonna have some outsiders basically kind of come in and look at what they're doing. And he said, they're going to let us across the board. That's not just for the offense. That's the whole operation. But what did you make of that? I mean, yeah, no, I did. I'm not going to comment yet. Evan, or Evan, what'd you make of that? Well, I mean, you can kind of look at it a, a couple of different ways. If you want to be uh, pessimistic about it, you could say Nebraska has a staff of, of 70 some football specific personnel and the fact that they need to go outside of that doesn't make you feel great. But I will say, I think on the other hand, there really is something to this idea that like sometimes you can get so locked in on what you do. And I think we've talked about that on this podcast before about how like you sometimes you just need like the guy watching on TV to be like, why don't you do this thing? Like, so you're not overthinking things. So you're not so far in your own head or, you know, you're so far into your own process that you don't see something that's obvious. So I give Matt real credit for that, for for saying, hey, let's let's reach out to some people that we trust, that know the game well, that can come in and spend a couple of days and say, hey, how are we? What what is our play calling apparatus look like? Is our communication as good as it could be? Is the the game planning as good as it could be? And it takes I think it takes some humility to do that. And I think it's the kind of thing that the previous head coach at Nebraska wouldn't have done. I think he would have said, I, you know, I, I, I believe our, what we're doing and I'm just going to keep going and it's going to change. I, I, so I, you know, I think I ultimately give a lot of credit for that to say that if you're in charge of something and it's not going well, you'd be silly to not reach out to somebody that you trust and get their opinion on it. So while it's unsettling in the short term, this idea that Nebraska doesn't have it all figured out, I think the fact that, they're open to some sort of change, especially midstream in the season when you can still turn things around can be encouraging. That's interesting that you said that, Evan, because I'm normally Mr. Optimism, like Mr. Glass is half full. And when I first saw that clip um, or, or read about it, I think I read a tweet or something, maybe it was Mitch Sherman or your or one of your tweets, Evan, but um, that they're bringing in outside eyes my initial reaction, I even tweeted this, was, hey, Matt Rule's making $8 million a year. Marcus Satterfield makes $1.4 million a year. And we need outside eyes to come in and figure out and tell us what our problems are. So that's, I mean, very rare pessimistic side of me. Fair. But I appreciate your take on that because, you know, as I was thinking about this as you were speaking, you know, Marcus Satterfield and Matt Rule clearly have, have a friendship or a relationship, right? They've worked together for many years. It would probably be kind of hard for you to go to your friend and say, hey, your offense really sucks right now. And tell them that, first of all. This way, I guess you've got outside eyes, as he said, coming in and, and diagnosing it for you instead of being like, hey, this isn't me coming down being hard on you. This is Joe Schmo that we brought in, who we both know. And it's going to be honest with us. So I get that part of it. It's just after all this, I don't know. It's just, it was a little concerning to me to be like, how, do they not know what's wrong after nine games in, in a season? That was, that was a little bit concerning to me, I guess. I, to piggyback off of that, I, I completely agree with you, Matt. That's the one thing that we had a conversation today at work was I think that he's going to exhaust every option that he has because to your point, and I hate to say, I don't think he wants to, you know, I, I don't think he wants to ever have to ad- admit the fact that he might have to consider firing a friend. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I guess so, uh, maybe the way I look at it is why 
and you see this happen a lot. Why do coaches surround themselves with the people that make it so difficult to have these conversations? You know what I mean? Like I get it. Like you're close. You have a good relationship, but that's just, that puts you in a really shitty spot if things don't go the right way. Yeah. But at the same time, like, absolutely. But at the same time, like you, when you're going to be in the foxhole, like they always say, you got to be in there with guys that you trust and you know, you're going to be able to communicate with, which I guess kind of, goes against what I just said about like maybe not being able to tell your friend that they're not doing their job well enough. I don't know. I think, uh, and for those of you watching on YouTube, you just got a glimpse of two-year-old Charlotte Burkle. Uh, and so, what a sweetheart. Uh, just a darling. Uh, she, was, she was asking me to turn it up so she could hear more, but I was hoping she would, <laughs> if I didn't do that, I had it on mute and I've got my headphones. Anyway, I was hoping then she would lose interest. And Anyway, she's back to watching Daniel Tiger now. Anyway, okay. Okay. Uh, so sorry about that. Uh, but um, uh, with this, like, I think it takes like you have to have a certain level as a certain combination of like confidence, but also open mindedness, humility, whatever it might be to say, I mean, think about I was thinking about this today uh, to dredge up old stuff. Like, would Polini have ever done something like that? <laughs> right? Like, probably would yeah, just double down and said, I'm doing things yeah. my way and whatever, whatever. And so like it takes it like I appreciate that rule is willing to say I this isn't working got it like let's get some extra let's get some fresh eyes on this thing and and maybe it'll help and maybe it'll work but but what what concerns it's not a sign that the year that in nine games into year two almost all the way through year two it's not a sign that the rebuild is working right or it's not a sign that it's going to plan and it's also if you think about where we were just a few games ago remember when mm-hmm. we were five and one guys mm-hmm. does anybody yeah, remember i that? remember that it wasn't yeah, that long ago that was nice Okay. And it was like year two, all the off, we had so many reasons to believe the off season hype and like so many reasons to say we are turning the corner. And again, I don't think anybody really thought we were playoff bound. And I don't think anybody thought we'd get through the season without stubbing our toe a little bit, but it was like, okay, well, we're five and one. We're definitely getting to a bowl game. How high can this thing go? Can we get to 10 and two? Can we get to nine and three, whatever it is. And now it's like the team seems to have gotten worse. They seem totally lost on offense. Dylan's you're bring, a shell of you're, you're, himself. Yeah, Dylan doesn't look good. Uh, you're bringing in outside consultants. You're bringing in McKenzie and company or whoever to to take a look at the whole operation. So it's just this feeling that Husker fans have had so many times of like, you know, our episode from our, our gamer, our recap this week was trust no one. This feeling that, we believe, we believe so. We believed in Frost. We believed in year two of Frost. It would really turn the corner. We were believe that it's like we buy in and we keep showing up and all these things. And it's like, does anybody know what they're doing here? Like, how does that, how does that team that beat Colorado and that like went to Columbus and competed their butts off? How does that team turn in the performance they turned in against UCLA? How does it feel like we are absolutely nowhere again? So, Two takeaways that I had from the press conference related to what you're saying, TJ. One is what Matt Rule said shortly after he he talked about what we just said, which is he he openly said, I, "Do I I need to look at my approach to things?" And this is a guy who turned around Temple, who turned around Baylor, who's coached in the NFL and and learned some hard lessons there. Who in year two in the fourth quarter of the season is saying. Do I need to look at things? Do I need to be tougher? Do I need to reevaluate game plans? Um, and that that's that's surprising. Like that's and, and he kind of came out and said, you know, talking about how inconsistent the team is, you, you don't normally say those things at a press conference, but he's he's one of the most honest coaches that Nebraska's had really in any sport. And so he's gonna come out there and say it. And so he's we're, we're kind of going along with him in real time as he's trying to figure this stuff out. So I think that's interesting. And the second point that he, that he went to that he's never really done to this extent has put the onus has been putting the onus on the players and saying, these guys need to make plays Mm. like, and, and even as it relates to the Marcus Satterfield discussion, he says, you know, when, when a guy makes a catch, it's, Hey, great, great catch. And when he doesn't make the catch, it's, ah, you know, Satterfield screwed us again. And, and he said the players yeah. need to have some accountability in that. They need to take ownership of that. 
He said in, in this week when you're on a buy and you're kind of stewing over things, like it's not on the coaches to stay positive and to grind and to stay engaged. It's on those players to do that. And so, you know, Matt Rule's been very careful about not naming guys or, or throwing players under the bus, so to speak, but this is as far as he's gone since he's been at Nebraska in terms of saying these guys, they're here, we treat them really well. I'm happy to have all these conversations with you, but dang it, when the game's here, you got to make plays and they haven't done enough of that. And so that's kind of the tension that they're fighting right now is, is it procedural? Is it philosophical? Is it talent? Is it all these other things? And it's probably a little bit of all of it. And I think that's what makes it so complex and, and hard to, and, and maybe frustrating is that you can't just point to one thing. It's a, it's a bunch of little things and your result is, you know, a flat performance at home against UCLA last week. That was the next thing I was going to go to um, about the press conference. And I feel like, you know, rules are in the benefit of the doubt. And a lot of times he's probably, you know, using those press conferences as a vehicle to say things directly to the players. And so you never know exactly where that's coming from, but boy, that, that one, that was the other thing that caught my eye and that felt a little bit, and he's been good about owning his, his stuff, right? I mean, he's taken yeah. responsibility. I feel like rule himself. As, as you just outlined, Evan, but that just felt a little bit like, I think, I think part of the fan base frustration is it's fine to say that about the players. And I don't, nobody wants to get him to get up there and slander Satterfield or whatever. Sure. But it's like, it's like, where are those ex It doesn't always feel like those expectations are on the coaches as well. Like clearly there's a lot wrong with the operation on offense. Well, and like, it's like, why aren't you saying that about Marcus Satterfield? Like, why are you, like, to me, I read that and I was like, this just sounds like you're blaming the players. And again, context, there could be other reasons for saying it. I'm not, I'm not throwing that. You know, I don't, we don't know why he said it, but it felt a little bit like blaming the players. And also it's like one way one could read this. And th I don't want to go down a little conspiracy theory. Jeff, you had something to say, so don't forget it. Sorry. No, I got it. By teeing up, players need to make plays too. And by saying we're going to have somebody else come in and look at this stuff, you're almost giving yourself an out. You could look at it both ways, but you're almost giving yourself an out to say, Oh, things with Satterfield are fine. We just got to fix X, Y, and Z. We need the players to make more plays. And then we realized we were doing these three things wrong with our offensive operation. And then everything with Satterfield is fine. Anyway, sorry, we don't, we don't have to go down that rabbit hole or we can come back to it, but Geoff, what were you going to say? No, I think, and Evan, you can correct me too, is I, I heard a quote from oh, when he was talking about the players and he had said something along the lines of like, we're never going to call a play that they can't execute. So they just need to, you know, be able to accomplish some of these things. But like you say that, but then like our opening, after they go down and score our, our opening drive, we just call three pass, pass plays in a row. And clearly they can't, they're having issues executing those right now. And Dylan's running for his life. So he's kind of, he's going both ways. So I kind of, I understand what he's saying but i under also understand that like it is kind of a way to get satterfield off the hook a little bit i feel like yeah yeah but i thought he was can i think he was pretty candid today too like he looked different he was, like he just didn't you know what See, i mean that's like, what it's i was like, like i thought he looked different. he looked he looked more tired than usual like he, to me if you're if you're in the into the reading tea leaves kind of deal I, I think he, he almost kind of looked like a guy who knows he's probably going to have to tell his friend he's got to find a new job after the end of the season. That's the way, I mean, that's kind of, I was, again, if you want to if try to read tea leaves, because it, it, he was way more definitive about, you know, talking about Satterfield last season, towards the end of last year. I remember there were people kind of questioning Satterfield a little bit then. Um and he, But he, I thought he was professional about it. He was smart the way, the way he spoke and didn't, didn't really call him out or anything like that, but the way he said that our offense hasn't been good enough and we're not running the ball like we want to, and it being that we're nine games in already, I don't, I was kind of read into it like, geez, he almost kind of looks like a guy who knows he's going to fire his buddy at the end of the year. But well, what, what he said afterwards was, or, or later in the presser was, he's frustrated, he's not defeated, he's working through that. Uh, I, the way I wrote it was, he was introspective with an edge. Like they were, they were thinking inward, but he had more of an edge to him today. You could just kind of, you could feel mm -hmm. that. Like, it's yeah. like, all right, you know, let's get this going. Like, does everyone else feel the urgency? I feel that kind of thing from him. So yeah, I mean, he's, he's searching and he's 
open about searching and, and whether they find an answer in the next month or not um, remains to be seen. But like, there's still a scenario here where you can figure some things out and win a game or two and play in the postseason. And, and that was the other thing he mentioned the last couple of weeks. He's been very um, hesitant to talk about bowl games and, and kind of the stuff that comes with winning. And, to, and today or, or Monday on the presser, he was like, this program needs to go to a bowl game. This program yeah. needs to get the extra practices. It needs to, to get some momentum and some tangible sign of progress. So like they're, they're feeling it. They're yeah. feeling it. I think so too. And I think another thing is just like year one, like you get the benefit of the doubt year two when it shows that we're like, maybe not trending in the right direction anymore. It's like, you know, it's all fun and good at those press conferences when things are going well, but now you're into that time of, Oh, welcome to Nebraska. Now you got to maybe right. start answering a little bit more of the difficult questions that you weren't necessarily getting season one or the first half of the season, obviously. So yeah, I think, when I, th I think for Nebraska fans, it's got to be tough to deal with. Yeah. I think for Nebraska fans too, we're all in the, in the position of we've, we've seen this movie before we've seen exactly. where it gets like, it's too late for a head coach to make a staff change. And we've seen where that leads. So I think we're all in the back of our mind. We're all kind of like, God, take care of it now. While we still have some semblance of like something that might work, do something about it now. So we're, it's not too late. And then it's like, we're all done. Yeah. Well, the one thing, I, for the love of God, do we always have to bring up PTSD on this podcast? Well, I swear to we're God. so scarred. We're so, we are but such it, a we, scorned lover. And we also keep living through it. Yeah. Like, we also keep living through the we same thing. We don't die. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We will not. Here's, a, we here's, a, here's a piece of. If we die, we die. You guys, can you guys uh, name a, a recent time when Matt Rule fired an offensive coordinator? Oh, I have no idea. No, you're you you you're gonna have to tell us, I'm, Evan. We would we wouldn't know that. This he was in no the NFL clue. in in 21 with Carolina. He fired Joe Brady. That's who was right. The architect of that LSU offense. Yeah. In 18. Okay. He fires the he fires. Uh, Brady in December, and this is what he said at the time. He said, I felt this was the right move, and it was just purely football. That was what he said the Monday after okay. firing Joe Brady. And so was that much better than than what Nebraska's putting out right now offensively? That's Yeesh. it's see, so there's a track record there. Yeah. Matt Rule doesn't want to fire guys in season. He's done it before. His two staff changes at Nebraska have both been off the field related. Uh, you know, behavior type stuff as opposed mm -hmm. to anything performance related, but there is a history there. And at some point you do, you know, you do have to make a change if the results continue to be the same. And certainly like, man, the, the outcome Saturday, like you guys said, it, it was so familiar. Like if this was a yeah. script, it wouldn't even make it to the, to the table read because it's so unoriginal and like, right. You know, when, when they, when they were down 20 and started coming back, I, I said to Sam in the press box, I'm like, they're going to get within a score and, and make people hope again. And they're going to lose. They're going to come up short in the end. And yeah. right. sure enough, because I mean, they've done yeah. it a hundred times before. Yeah. And what, and what a goofy, silly, almost inappropriate way for that game to end with the interception oh, off the leg yeah. of you know, a UCLA defender yeah. too. And it's just like, I mean, it's, it's, it would be comical if it wasn't so, predictable and sad uh so how these that's a great are. great analogy like oh like oh great another shitty remake you know what i mean like <laughs> right. that's exactly what we're seeing every week a shitty remake it's just yeah. like the death this is this death star again how many times are we could do the death star storyline <laughs> <Right. Yeah. laughs> we've seen this before <laughs> good lord well, just obje Wade. objectively speaking evan and it's not fair without the context but like we, we think about it, you got an offensive coordinator almost at the end of year two. They were historically bad on offense in year one, but you could come up with all sorts of reasons why, you know, you could excuse that or try to explain that away almost all the way through year two. I did a little looking today. Nebraska's offense is 100th in the nation in scoring offense, 99th in total offense, 104th in rushing offense and 67th in passing offense. They don't do anything well. No. And they don't seem to know what they want to do a lot of the time. And mm -hmm. they've talked about committing to the run, but they don't commit to the run. And they don't, I, I made this point on, in our last episode, 
they don't do like they don't seem to do anything like UCLA had some plays where they just rolled like rolled Garbers out a little bit and had an easy dump off to a tight end. They don't seem to do anything to try to make it simpler for Riola. Right. Just all this straight drop back stuff. And it just reminds me of the Riley days and Charlotte's Charlotte's joining the conversation. And we're talking. That's all right. Yeah. Well, it'd be um, different. It'd be different too. Like, like we, we've had a couple of times where a defense or two or three threw something at us that we weren't planning on. Well, that'd be nice if you said, okay, well, let's scrap what our original game plan was and go to our bread and butter. But we don't know what we don't have a yeah. bread and butter. So it's like, okay, right. we were gonna we were gonna work, throw a lot of screens this game, or we're gonna throw a lot of slants this game, or we're gonna run uh, a lot of ISO or a lot of zone read this game. It's like we don't have that those few things or like a or an identity. We keep saying identity. It feels like that's the the term that's we've been saying it a lot. It's like, that's it's like for the sure. culture thing. That's a, you know, but they don't have one. So like when when things go run amok and chaos is coming at you in the form of six or seven defenders coming after the quarterback instead of four or five, then we haven't had the ability to be like, okay, they're doing this now. Here's what, how we adjust. And here's what we have that we can run against that. That's what it feels like. We don't really, once the game plan is found out to maybe this, our game plan isn't going to work. There's nothing to go to. There's no adjustments. That's what it feels like to me as a, as a common fan. Yeah, and like you, you contrast that with other teams in the Big Ten. Like when you think Oregon offense, I think we all kind of know what that looks like. When you think of Iowa offense, hey, they've been they've been pretty good this year. Mm-hmm. As much as uh, they I'm were an easy target a year ago, they've been they've been pretty decent. Like you know what that's going to look like. Minnesota, you know what that's going to look like. USC, you know what that's going to look like. With Nebraska, I mean they they throw a dozen screens against Ohio State one week and zero against UCLA. The next it's that old saying jack of all trades master of none and that's kind of where nebraska is they try to to scheme to the opponent and try to outthink the opponent so much that they they don't ever do that certain thing well and and of course anyone who's old enough to remember knows what nebraska in the 90s did well offensively like that that team had an identity even if they didn't win national championships you knew what that approach was going to be with the option and, and how that all looked. And so it's been a discussion we've had for Nebraska fans have had for a long time about what does that look like? How can you win in the Midwest, especially when the weather gets cold and it's windy? Incidentally, Wisconsin, which is really struggling right now, an opponent for Nebraska in a few weeks, they made their their Bill Callahan hire in Luke Fickle going away from their identity, and they're really struggling right now. They're hurt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're trying to figure things out. So like the you can't overstate the importance of knowing what you want to do. And, and it's a great point, Maddie, about like when things don't go well, what do you fall back on? Mm-hmm. And if you if you're not if you don't have any specialty, then you're just kind of grasping and hoping and, and trying. And, and that's where they've been certainly the last few weeks. Yeah. The offense is very Riley-esque to watch. It's very frustrating, but it's also frustrating that they don't seem to be able to figure out. Other teams get better as the year goes on. It's always like Iowa always, almost every year it feels like Iowa like loses to somebody they shouldn't early, maybe more than one once. And they're working through some things. And then by the time we get to them, they're like playing their best football. And it feels like we never are. And that's so frustrating. <laughs> right. Um, and sorry, go ahead, Jeff. No, the only thing I was just, since we're talking about finding an identity, like I feel like the first few games of the season, like we kind of did, like we had that dude quarterback, like, do you, like, I think about going back to like the Colorado game and like, you know, Dylan's throwing sidearm passes. He's throwing it in tight windows. We're completing passes and making it look easy and it will. And I don't know if it's because he's banged up, but do you guys think that like, is he kind of scared out there now? I feel like he's kind of rattled almost to, like, yeah. to the point where, because he's he's not making the same pass as he used to. He's missing. He's not seeing wide open people. If he is seeing somebody wide open, he's a lot of times he's not making that pass anymore. And I just feel like he's he's changed a little bit over the last few games. Well, I'm just curious to see what you guys think about that. Like, is he hurt or is this like a, a reflection of like he's not confident in what what offenses we're running? He just doesn't. He's like running for his life back there. He doesn't feel safe. Scary. I think he's yeah, I think he's I think he's seeing ghosts a little bit. I mean, he's getting blitzed like crazy. 
and having, and like you've said, having to run for his life and try to make plays on the move. And yeah, yeah I think, I, I don't think he is. I don't think he's playing. I don't think he's playing with a lot of confidence, but I, I mean, I understand. I just, like, you yeah. know, if we can't, we can't get the run guy. game, can't get the run game going. And then, you know, a couple of guys get through and, and then he's getting chased or he's getting sacked. Like, yeah, it makes you Again. think after a while. Well, I, I mentioned that, like, when we ever have to feel the kick, I gasp, like, on special teams. Last year, I used to have to gasp whenever we ran any sort of passing play. I gasped every time we threw the ball. And I almost feel like I'm doing that again. Like, it's coming back. Like, if we drop back to pass, I'm like, here we go. What, yeah. what terrible thing is going to happen this time? Like, we're back to that again. And I cannot believe that we are back to that point, just like that. I think yeah. you're right, though. I think there is an injury component. Certainly, we saw it late in the UCLA mm -hmm. game where he took the hit to the back when he was going for the goal line, and, and that locked up on him again when he tried to come back on the field. But, I mean, he was hurt, I think, before that. You could tell he was limping with his ankle a little bit. And, I mean, yeah. you get to this point in any Big Ten football season, and, like, you're going to be – it's the black and blue league for a reason, and it's getting yeah, colder no and, and all the rest. Um, but I do think, too, his – reads of the defense have been erratic at best. I mean, that pick six, uh, Thomas Fedoni was open on a, on a little post over the middle and Riola didn't see him. And he threw short to Jamal Banks and the throw short wasn't particularly accurate and it's intercepted and brought back and, and the defender hurdles Riola at the goal line just to add insult to injury there. But like, that was an example of kind of the, the turning point in that game mm -hmm. uh, as an example of just, you're not seeing it well. I, you know, I, yeah, he's taken some sacks. I wouldn't say the offensive line has been terrible with pass protection. Uh, it's just, there, there were just so many moments I thought in that game Saturday, especially where you're like, somebody's open. Um, and, and, and UCLA would, would blitz the safety. They, they had a delayed safety blitz at one point. And Ramir Johnson's running open down the field and, and Rayola just didn't see him. And he takes the sack and like, you know, they, they never made UCLA pay for those secondary blitzes. And like, that's something you got to do. Mm -hmm. That's something Matt Rule said. This stuff's going to be invaluable for him as he goes along in his career. That's I mean, that's really all you can hope at this point as a Nebraska fan is that these experiences shape him in the next year or two for what they can become. Because right now it's just piling up into missed opportunities and another one score loss. I want, I want to pivot guys quickly, not quickly, but pivot next to this conversation seemingly overnight, at least on social media has kind of popped up about a concern or a lingering concern about apathy among the fan base. And I've just seen some folks kind of say like one comment I saw, I can't remember who it was, was basically like, you know, the, the university is going to have to be really, concerned that people are going to start tuning out and stop watching this. And it was something like, I'm going to keep watching, but I wouldn't blame people for how, whatever they choose to do. And so I just, I wanted to put that out there for the group and see like what you guys think about that and how you guys are feeling. Um, I did, I, I did find like when we, when we threw the pick and the game was over, like, some people in front of us had left and I smacked the the bench in front of me at the, at the game. Right. <laughs> but I did, I did also find like walking out of there. It's no longer this like disbelief and rage. Like how could this is ha have happened? It's a little bit more numb. Like, of course this happened again. I didn't yeah. really believe something good was going to happen. Right. And so for me, I, I think about myself, but I think a lot of Husker fans are similar where um, they, um, one second, guys, I'm sorry. I, uh, well, talk, take this apathy conversation, please. I, I want to jump in on this real quick when you're trying to, because I do have a, a, a legit opinion on this. So when we're talking about like now in the days of modern college football, it's not about just going to games and, and watching a game or watching it on TV. They're asking for a lot more. And granted, I, I don't get to go to a lot of games. I'm fortunate enough when somebody provides me a ticket. So my financial investment in the program is 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 nothing really. But you are asking people Weird. to buy season Costanza. tickets. 
<laughs> You're asking people to buy tickets. Now we're asking people to donate money for NIL. You're asking a lot, and this is almost turning into an investment. You're no longer just a fan. You're an investor in this team. And when you start not receiving a return on that investment, you're going to pull your money or you're going to jump ship and invest somewhere else. So I do understand that I could see people tuning out after a while, or maybe I'm not going to donate money to the, the, to, to NIL, or maybe, maybe I'll give up these season tickets. Like, so I understand that whether or not people actually do that is completely different because I don't know how, if you live in this city and in this state, you just completely zone out Nebraska football. That's just impossible. Right. It's not right. our DNA. That's never going to happen. I think people like to make that threat as if we're all going to be like, no, you're kidding. Don't yeah. go anywhere. It's like, yeah, come on. <laughs> I mean, if, if people haven't checked out by now, they're not going to. Exactly. I, I think that like TJ said it before we started recording, like the fan apathy conversation always seems to creep in when the season's going South and things aren't going real well, mm -hmm. but you know, I can't see like, there's so many of these people like you know, you talk to people like I, I'm the third one in my generation that has these season tickets or things like that. Like people don't just like stop going. They don't just give it up. Right. Like it, mm -hmm. there might be a few. Okay. But the majority are going to still keep showing up on Saturdays because it's what we do. It's part of it's ingrained in who we are. If, if that's really how you feel, then you can't just like turn it off. Like you're still going to, even mm -hmm. if you say, I'm not going to go to games anymore, you're still going to turn on the damn TV at home and see what's going on in the game. And you know what, when things yeah. do end up start going well, cause this can't go on forever guys like this. There's, there's hey, no way. I don't know about that. <laughs> Jeff, you stop. <laughs> I believe, I believe that for a long time. I think I still believe that <laughs> this can't go on forever. And so, the, you know, it's, it'd be in my, my style is like, I wouldn't want to be, be the guy that made the decision to like walk away give up my tickets, whatever it might be. And then the team starts turning it around and starts. To, and then I'm, then I'm just like easing back into the room or like, well, how does that even work? Being a, being somebody like that. I could, I couldn't do it. And I think a lot yeah. of Husker fans are the same way. Like, no, that's my team. I have yeah. one team. We're not all GF and Langenberg, GF and Lincoln, where we've got whoa, whoa, two whoa, favorite whoa, take teams. It easy. One's not doing <laughs> so hard. Hey, I'll just easy. throw on my other shirt. What the hell did I do? <laughs> and go, what and the go hell did I do here? Yeah. What the hell did I do? <laughs> Sorry, Jeff. No, you're, 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 you're bound to catch a stray there. You know, you know what the difference is? The, the difference is like between Husker basketball and football. Husker basketball is like going to the new club and meeting up with friends and like it's exciting and it's different. And Husker football, when things are going like they're going, is like when you're a kid and you go to church and you're like, well... We gotta, we gotta be here. Um, I guess my, you know, this is what we do. Uh, Sit up straight. Uncross your miss. arms. Like yeah. it's, it sucked so much of the joy from the experience. So like the people generally yeah. are still there. The, the scanned ticket numbers would tell you that it's, it's less than it was, but it's just, it's, it's become very obligatory in a lot of ways. The like new, sure. Yeah, it's like the new priest's homilies aren't very good or, you know, like, yeah. that's, that's not a good, a, a rules homilies are really good. But, you so, know. And, and here's one other point I'd make about apathy. I think when it really sets in is when you go, when you start stacking seasons without making significant changes. So like to me, when I think of the biggest apathy, it was after the 21 season when you didn't know if Scott Frost was coming back. They end up firing a few assistants he comes back, the enthusiasm level was really low for the 22 season because very little had changed. Trev Alberts at the time said, there's really no empirical evidence to suggest this is going to work, but we're going to do it because he's a Husker. Yeah. So like what I look, how you, how you look at that, I think right now is sure. If they say they lose out and they go five and seven again, it, people are going to be really oh. disgusted. It's, it's going to be a low point. But you know what? If they make a change at a, a coordinator and if they raid the portal and if they finish the recruiting class strong, you can bet that by next summer, people are going to be excited and at least yeah. have hope that's what, that things that's can change. But if that doesn't happen, that's, that's, I think, where some of that apathy comes in. Is like, are you going to roll it back with what we just saw? you got to have something more than that. This isn't 100%. Wrigley Field where guys are going to people are going to pack the stands and you can put out a losing product at some point. You got to change things around to start winning games. Now we'll, we'll find a way to talk our way into anything. I mean, you know this next 
we could finish out, yeah, five and seven. But in the off season, we'll ch- we'll hash things out, and by next summer, come August, we'll talk ourselves into another playoff run. Trust me, it's 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 a sick disease. We all suffer from it. It is. I mean, Chattel's Chattel's line in his uh, preseason piece was so good. He's and he referred to the Nebraska fan base as being undefeated against apathy. And I think I I just don't see that ever changing. I mean, I feel like we'd need like 30 more consecutive losing seasons. It's just something terrible and drastic to happen for that to, (laughs) for that to have, you know, but I'm just saying, I'm saying like, I just yeah. don't see that ever changing as, as you guys are all saying, I do think there's like some effect on the periphery a little bit. Like I know for me, there's times when I see something a coach said or a player said, or an article, sorry, Evan, an article. And if they're nine and oh, I'm, or, you know, seven and oh, like they were in 2016, I'm reading everything I can get my hands on. What are people in other States say, what are the national media guys saying? What are the other fan bases saying? What are our guys saying? What is everybody saying about this team that I love? When this stuff starts going on, you see somebody says something and you kind of roll your eyes or sometimes or like I still end up reading a lot, a lot of it. But like you just kind of like, oh, OK, you know, you, you just I think the fan base is in prove it mode. And they're like you, there was there was so much irritation in the stadium on Saturday at different points, I felt like. And actually, that's a good segue. I thought it was really interesting. Did you guys see the the tweet thread from former Husker linebacker Colin Miller? Yeah. Yes. So you guys can find it on, on Twitter. It's several, several tweets long. And so I'm not going to read it, but he is at C underscore M I L L Z 31 at C underscore mills, thirty one mills with a Z. And he kind of called out the fans. Uh, he basically said, he was basically saying we had a chance to clinch a bowl so game our fault. as we took a, a, a lot of people took it that way. As we took uh, took on a two and five UCLA team, we needed one win. Uh, I'm just going to read bits and pieces. No buzz, no energy, no sort of electricity going through the air from kickoff. Um, we had home field advantage, and it did not feel like it whatsoever. And it goes on and on and on. And this generated a lot of discussion on on Twitter today. Um, I think it's um, bullshit, personally. Uh, Same and. I'll tell you how, I, but I would. I, I part of what it made me think about was I realized at the game. And I, you guys know, I live out of the state, so I don't get to go in person that often. But I found myself at the game. I, I stood almost the whole time. I cheered. Me but I you found were up myself, I, I found myself yeah. almost feeling like a holding my breath feeling and a hyperventilating feeling, and almost like. We have like, like, it, it, I feel like people are feeling the fans are feeling that tension as much, or maybe more so than the players yeah. are. Like, it felt like so. this is our best chance for bowl eligibility. And then it certainly didn't help things when UCLA holds the ball for almost the entire first quarter yeah. and scores, goes field goal, touchdown, field goal on their first three possessions. And the defense came out flat and the offense looks terrible. Like, <clears throat> um, so I think there was a lot of factors that went into it, but I felt like the crowd was, we, we, I've, we've seen more juiced crowds for sure. Yeah. But I thought the crowd was in pretty good shape at the beginning of the game at points throughout the first half. And then I thought, I felt like at the start of the second half, it was kind of like, all right, it's only 13, seven. We got the ball. I felt the crowd was back at the beginning of, of the second half. I don't know about you guys. And then that fit, pick six, just like, six. what do you, what do you want us to do? Moon. What right. do you want them to do? Well, like, yeah, that's the thing. As a fan, <laughs> you can only stand up and scream on third down so many times and watch them keep converting for you to right. just it, it mean you 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 eventually you're not gonna stand, you're not gonna stand up and be loud. You're just kind of like, oh God, please just get off the field. You know, it's like I don't know, I don't know. It's it's hard to explain. The, I thought the stadium definitely it wasn't the same energy as UTEP or Colorado or, or Illinois or Rutgers, but I think UCLA just took this took the stadium out of the crowd or the, the crowd out of the game early on. And it, and it, sometimes it's hard. The, the team's got to do something to get the crowd excited to get them back into the game yeah, in that scenario. Scenario. So yeah, I mean, it, was the crowd the best it's been all year? No. Was it good enough? I think so. The the team's got to do something to have the fans cheering. Like you, we yeah, can't, and- aren't just gonna cheer for for just like awful performance. Like I don't there's know. there's a little bit of nuance. Like some people, some people who responded to him took it as, 
you're blaming the fans for the 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 plight of the program or whatever. And he, he made clear that's not what I'm saying. Like yeah. he made clear, like, you know, just felt like the energy could have been better, et cetera, et cetera. But I felt it was hard for me not to get defensive in reading that whole thread. And it was hard for me not to say the fans are the furthest thing from the problem with this program. UCLA gets nobody at their games and they're two. They came in at two and five. They have not, they had no reason to keep fighting and keep playing. And they had way more, they brought their own energy into a hostile environment, or at least on a, maybe it wasn't that hostile. It says Colin Miller, but they brought to a road game. And they punched us in the mouth and we didn't seem to recover. Right. So I just, I don't like, I have no yeah. patience for that. And I don't want to make it personal, but it was a little bit frustrating too, coming from someone from the frost era. Where you're like, go there. I'm sorry. Like not, doesn't feel like we got a lot, you got a lot of ground to stand on there, Mr. Yeah. No, I, I mean, yeah. no offense to the kid, but I had to, had to kind of be like, Oh, wait a minute. Didn't, did he play? Wasn't he, the, was he a linebacker? And, yeah, he played a fair. I felt Evan, like I, I, he, it was, I think he started a couple of seasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Evan, I I want to get your I want to get you to jump in on this too and get your opinion. But real quick, I do feel like that dude really discredited himself with. He put that picture on there too, of this was the yeah. game with two minutes and thirty seconds left, and people and are sitting. Clearly, if you zoom in on it, there's like eleven fifty left in the game. Like, and it looked like yeah. it was like a timeout. It looked like yeah, a TV it was timeout. Timeout. Why are you posting yeah. stuff? He didn't. Like that? He didn't like do himself that's... any favors to make a point by posting the picture, insinuating like this is what it looks like during right. game during gameplay. Yeah. So, right. yeah. I, I, mean, I, I think, think it's guys... a it's kind of a big nothing burger. It's just like people looking for something to be mad at. I think. That's I think you guys true. made, I mean, a bunch of great points. I mean, UCLA holds the ball the entire first quarter. They're up. Absolutely, that's going to take the crowd out of the game. Relative to Colorado, no, this crowd was not electric. I remember going down about an hour before, 45 minutes, and thinking kind of a late arriving crowd, maybe a little bit sleepy, kind of felt like an 11 a.m. game mm -hmm. a little bit. Uh, but, you know, again, how, how can you blame them? Like, just the, the fan base has been through the ringer. I do feel like late in the game, they got back into it once that 20-point deficit turned into seven. Like there were still some people were people were excited and getting into it and and, and all yeah. the rest. So, you know, I know I don't I think the crowd's way down the list on of, of the things yeah. that that this program needs to worry about. The one thing I'll say is, I think specific to UCLA, like every loss, it seems like there's been something specific to the opponent that like really irks you. Like so, like the the Indiana loss was like, oh hey, here's a first year coach who's turning it around right away, like sticking it in Nebraska's face. I think the UCLA thing to me was like, here's a program that's like the twentieth most interesting thing to do in LA. And as you guys mentioned, very yeah. few people show up. <laughs> Their old head coach left to be the offensive coordinator at Ohio State. They made a late hire of a guy who who just made a kind of a fool of himself at Big Ten Media Days and Deshaun Foster, mm -hmm. and they still come into Lincoln and win this game against a team and a fan <laughs> yeah. base that cares exponentially more about the results than anybody from UCLA does outside of the, the maybe the players and the coaches. So, like, I think that's the other thing is every week there's just something – that just sticks you a little bit more as a Husker fan to say they're barely yeah. caring. They're receiving a half share from the league. They're traveling multiple time zones. You know, they're playing in cold weather to, in, in their own minds, like, and they still find a way. And so it's not just Nebraska, but it's these teams that are beating Nebraska that just add to the misery. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't think it was possible, Evan, but you made me feel worse with that breakdown because there's a few <laughs> things there that I didn't even consider. So thank Sorry you. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh man well look we we talked about this at the end of the last episode we have no choice like it, it i think first of all i agree with the sentiment that husker fans are like allowed to feel any kind of way they want to feel right now if you're pissed off if you're saying you're never going to watch again because we all know it's not true but like if you're if you're saying i'm not going to read i'm not going to watch i need a break i need a bye week whatever like you can't like this fan base has been so uniquely outstanding. Husker fans are allowed to feel however they want to feel, but we know come USC, come Wisconsin, come mm. Iowa. We're going to be in the cockpit. We're going to be strapped in. It's bowl eligibility or bus. Let's do it again. Us. And <laughs> we're going to be, I'm already talking myself into why we See, we're back. USC we're back. And, USC. and so like <laughs> the common fans are going to keep showing up. We like, we, 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 
did this all last season. We thought this year we'd kind of like, we'd kind of be bowl eligible already, <laughs> but just get us to that sixth win. Get us to the Vandalay Industries Bowl in Sheboygan, Wisconsin on December 12th or whenever it is. We're dancing in the streets. We're going bowling. Like we just, we got up. Like, and that's, I, I feel like, not to the point of being desperate, I feel like Rule needs to be feeling that a little bit. Like if that means Heinrich Harburg running the option 20 times against USC, or if that means, I don't know, coming up with some of our own recalls coming off a of bye week. We got to uh, pounce on that too. Or whatever, because- like, We've got to find a way. We've got to find a way to win one of these spot games. Right USC's in a bad yeah. spot too. They're in a bad it's spot. Wisconsin. Right Wisconsin's now. in a bad and spot. And Wisconsin's in a bad spot. Yeah. Hey, can no. I ask you guys real quick? You're talking about fan apathy. You guys are in the stands. Is there a certain demographic within the fan base that you think might be more vulnerable to apathy? Is it that young generation that's never felt Husker power? Is it the donors who are sick of paying? Money to guys that aren't uh, producing results? Is it, you know, guys our age? Like, if there is a section that is vulnerable to apathy, where do you think that would start? Younger That's generation. Great sure. question. You That's think me. younger? People yeah. say the younger generation. I actually noticed some young guys probably in their 20s when we were walking out, and they were just so frustrated. They were just like, yeah. ah, I just get so old. I can't remember what they were saying, but they were so mad, and I was just like, it made me feel good. Like it made me <laughs> yeah, feel good. Yeah, like, they care so okay, much. Yeah. Okay. Like these guys probably, you know, it's a rite like of that. passage, son. It's a rite yeah, of passage. Exactly. <laughs> Their best memory is probably some nine and three Polini team or something. Yeah. And they're like, they're just as mad. You know what I'm saying? So, but I do, it probably is that, that younger group, I don't know, 20 and younger, 30 and younger, something like that. Um, but I just, I, I tend to agree with it. I keep coming back to, Again, maybe we see it at the fringes a little bit. Maybe somebody chooses not to watch an away game occasionally or something, but it just feels like a huge leap to think that any part of this fan base is going to no. start to become apathetic I mean, anytime soon. We can know? only speak of our own echo chamber here with our our immediate group of friends. Like, I mean, the last seven years is proof of it. Like, we were last, you know, what was it? Uh, 2022, we're three and eight going into the Iowa game. And we're all still just absolutely locked in. Like we just wanted to beat Iowa, you know? Yeah. So I don't know if we're a fair judge, Evan, to say like, who's the demographic that feels it's like it's you. most apathetic. It's yeah. not, I don't think it's, yeah, it's us. Definitely in not our, our generation. Process of elimination. It's not yeah. you guys. Yeah. We're, we're old enough to, to remember the glory years and, and, and be able to witness it with our own two eyes. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. Well, I don't, even, at the game, my almost you know my nine year old my well we stayed uh, my my both my boys went and and their cousin too. Those kids were dialed into the end. I think it was like twenty seven fourteen, and my wife leaned over, saying, "Everybody, everybody doing okay?" She wasn't even suggesting that we leave or anything. She said, "Everybody doing okay?" And Michael was like, "We're still in this thing. We could still win this thing, you know." And it was just sounds like, like his dad. Yeah, yeah exactly. 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 Yeah. But I just think it's it's a long you know it's just something that's passed on in the, in the bloodline and in the, in the traditions and in everything else, right. Where um, it's a family affair to watch these games and it's a family yeah. affair to like cl- follow this team and know everything about the players and know everything about the coaches and all this stuff. And so the fan base deserves a winner. We're certainly not giving up on, on Matt rule yet. I think he would probably even admit that this is season has sort of taken a turn in a direction that he did not expect, but I think Evan, I thought I think your point is a really, really good one too, where like I think it was going into that 2021 season, thinking like, why should we expect it to be any different going into year four or yeah. frost? And then I think like Jojo Doman said he was coming back. And then it ended up being like four or five or six like senior defenders said they were coming back, and a couple other things happened. And suddenly by February or March, it was like well, let me tell you why I think this actually might be different this year, you know, and that's just, that's the way it always goes. Yeah, that's right. I, and they're going to do a bunch of work in December and sign a recruiting class and people are going to be excited. So that's the beauty of sports. That's the yeah. the agony of sports, I suppose, if things don't work out. But yeah, you can bet that those that follow the program, you're going to have reason to hope by next spring, next summer. Oh, yeah. We'll get, we'll uh, get some... brought to you by, brought to you by the common fans. By the way. We'll get some transfer portal defensive end who two years ago had six sacks for SMU. <laughs> Last year didn't play because he was hurt, 
but he's going to be amazing for Nebraska. And then we'll <laughs> all be ready to roll. I'm just going to pre-write that right now. That's yeah, good. Do you, yeah. do you have it, Matt, do you have inside no. intel on that, or do you want to share? Uh, may or may not. <laughs> hey, off the record. Off the record. All right. All right. G off real quick before are you wearing the V A the O H I O podcast beanie? Yes, you are. Uh, yes, I am. I was gonna bring that up too. Evan, you might want to wonder why I'm wearing He's this making beanie good on a bat, I think. the state of Ohio on it. We are part of the college huddle. And our buddy, I call him Wade Boggs. His name is actually Eric Boggs. Um, I predicted a Husker win for that Ohio State game, as you know. And yeah, yeah, Matt, Matt and Jeff went on their show. That so yeah, that did, predicted this, this is your did not deliver. This is my punishment. I have to wear this for the show. So uh, hope you're happy, Wade. Yeah, sh- you shout out to shout out to the college huddle. Check out thecollegehuddle.com. It's a bunch of podcasts like ours from other fan bases and a lot of written content as well. It's a really fun group that we've been able to be a part of. And if you're a college sports fan, I think you'll really like it. Uh, and then particular shout out to Wade Boggs from the OHIO podcast, who kind of recruited, who did recruit us to be part of the college huddle. And I mean, that guy is incredible. He's always, oh, I think yeah. he watches, I think Super he watches our, our shows regularly. I think he watches other people's regularly too. So I'm always yeah. appreciative of that. I feel like I can barely, it's all we can do to get our episodes recorded sometimes. So yeah, I'm yeah. kidding. Well, Amazing Jeff, you should piece. wear that. You should wear that. The beanie looks great on you. You should, Thank if you, you had to choose that. between, at least it's red. So if you had to choose between that and Notre Dame, I'm thinking like now, na- don't, don't that. start. Okay. I'm thinking about if I can just wear it maybe backwards or just flip this thing out. You know, it kind of, you know, the, the state of Ohio, it. I'm just realizing the state of Ohio, it almost kind of looks like it from a distance. It could be a Wu-Tang logo. <laughs> So you, you, you might be able to get away with wearing that to a Husker event. I don't know. I don't think that many Husker fans are going to be like, why is he wearing the outline of the state of Ohio on his hat? That's true. Yeah. After we stop recording, uh, maybe you can explain to me what Wu-Tang is. But um, <laughs> uh, I, for, I forgot you have the musical yeah. uh, taste of, of a seven-year-old man. <laughs> yeah. TJ uh, likes probably the closer to 80 at this point. The, yeah, but yeah, the, Do- <laughs> the Doobie Brothers and maybe the Rolling Stones, I think. Right? No, 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 oh, just, just the classics Sinatra, Tony Bennett, <laughs> the crooners. He's more of a you, crooner. guys are, you guys are speaking my language now. All of the above Stones, go. Sinatra, give me some Elvis, maybe. All of the above. And have some Werther's originals while you're in yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. There you go. got one in his pocket a, right now. And a call from your grandson. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, Evan, any final thoughts? <laughs> I just hope everybody enjoys the bye week, man. You know, spend some time with your families. Yeah. They let you invest in this stuff. <laughs> right? Like, Nebraska, you love Nebraska football. It hasn't loved you back in a while. Spend some time with your family. Get some early Christmas shopping done. Yeah, figure out your Thanksgiving recipes. All that good stuff. Take, take a, Enjoy there college football this weekend. The, the college football playoff pictures starting to come into focus it's it's, yeah. it's entertaining and yeah nebraska is not yeah. part of it but dang it this is a pretty entertaining there, there sport. enjoy some games i'm gonna spend my bye week trying to figure out how to get my butt to that usc game actually yes. so uh i, I don't go. know if that's i don't know how likely that is probably about a 10 percent chance right now but i was looking at mm, some there's a chance i have some airline miles today and some flight schedules and like there's different ways this could come together so i'll keep you guys posted on that oh, i love that Boom. Should probably like take walks and not think about Nebraska football during the bye week, but you know that's impossible. Yeah, look at you. Yeah, yeah look at you. It's totally sick. impossible. You're stick in the head, man. <laughs> I know. I love it. I love being like this, Jeff. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Evan. Thanks for hanging out with us. Um, Always fun. Hang in there, common fans. We got three more games left. Nobody's giving up on this season. No. Nobody's giving up on this fun old fashioned family Christmas. We're gonna make <laughs> this happen. We're gonna we're gonna get there. We're gonna get to a bowl game, and we're gonna. We're all in this game. together. We're all in this together. <laughs> we're gonna get through it with a lot of help from Jack Daniels. Uh, all right. Thanks as always, common fans. We'll be back at you soon. In the meantime, as always, GBR for life.